Good morning. Uh, today's passage comes from Nehemiah chapter 11 and 12. We'll be reading all of chapter 11 and ending at verse 26 and chapter 12. This is God's word. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of 10 to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of 10 remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. These are the chiefs of the province who lived in Jerusalem, but in the towns of Judah, everyone lived on his property in their, in their towns. Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. And in Jerusalem lived certain of the sons of Judah and of the sons of Benjamin, of the sons of Judah, Athaiah, the son of Uzziah, son of Zechariah, son of Amariah, son of Shephatiah, son of Mahalalel, of the sons of Perez, and Maasaiah, the son of Baruch, son of Colhose, son of Hazaiah, son of Adaiah, son of Joyarib, son of Zechariah, son of the Shilonite. All the sons of Perez who lived in Jerusalem were 468 valiant men. And these are the sons of Benjamin, Salu, the son of Meshulam, son of Joed, son of Pedaiah, son of Kolaiah, son of Masaiah, son of Ithael, son of Jeshaiah, and his brothers, men of valor, 928. Joel, the son of Zikri, was their overseer. And Judah, the son of Hasinua, was second over the city. Of the priests, Jediah, the son of Joyarib, Jekin, Seraiah, the son of Hilkiah, son of Meshulam, son of Zadok, son of Merioth, son of Ahitub, ruler of the house of God, and their brothers who did the work of the house, 822. And Adaiah, the son of Jor Joram, son of Peleliah, son of Amzai, son of Zechariah, son of Peshur, son of Melchijah, and his brothers, heads of father's houses, 242. And Amashsai, the son of Azarel, son of Azai, son of Meshilamoth, son of Emer, and their brothers, mighty men of valor, 128. Their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of Hegedalim. And of the Levites, Shemaiah, the son of Heshub, son of Izrakam, son of Hashabiah, son of Benai, son of Shabbatai, and Josabad, of the chiefs of the Levites, who were over the outside work of the house of God. And Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, who was the leader of the praise, who gave thanks, and Bakbakiah, the second among his brothers. And Abda, the son of Shamua, son of Galal, son of Jedathan, all the Levites in the holy city were 284. The gatekeepers, Akub, Talman, and their brothers, who kept watch at the gates, were 172. And the rest of Israel, and of the priests and the Levites, were in all the towns of Judah every one in his inheritance. But the temple servants lived on a fell, and Zihah and Gishpah were over the temple servants. The overseer of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzai, the son of Benai, son of Hashabiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micah, of the sons of Asaph, the singers, over the work of the house of God. For there was a command from the king concerning them, and a fixed provision for their singers, as every day required. And Pethahiah, the son of Meshezabel, of the sons of Zerah, the sons of Judah, was at the king's side in all matters concerning the people. And as for the villages with their fields, some of the people of Judah lived in Kiriath Arba in its villages, and in Dibon in its villages, and in Jacob Zael in its villages, and in Jeshua, and in Meloda, and in Beth Palet, and in Hazar Shual, and in Beersheba in its villages in Ziklag, in Mekona, and its villages, in Enrimon, in Zorah, in Jarmuth, and Zanoah, and Adalam, and their villages, Lachish, and its villages, and Ezekah, and its villages. So they encamped from Beersheba to the valley of Hinnom. The people of Benjamin also lived from Geba onward, and Michmash, Aijah, Bethel, and its villages, Anathoth, Nab, Ananiah, Hazar, Ramah, Gitaim, Hadid, Zeboim, Nebelet, Lad, and Ono, the Valley of Craftsmen. And certain divisions of the Levites in Judah were assigned to Benjamin. Chapter 12. 
These are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Jeshua, Sarahiah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maluk, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rahum, Merimoth, Edo, Genethoi, Abijah, Mijamin, Madiah, Bilgah, Shemaiah, Joyarib, Jediah, Salu, Amok, Hilkiah, Jediah. These were the chiefs of the priests and of their brothers in the days of Jeshua. And the Levites, Jeshua, Benuai, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, who with his brothers was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. And Bakbakiah and Unai, and their brothers stood opposite them in the service. And Jeshua was the father of Joachim, and Joachim the father of Eliashib, and Eliashib the father of Joida, Joida the father of Jonathan, and Jonathan the father of Jadua. And in the days of Joachim were priests, heads of fathers' houses, of Saraiah, Meraiah, of Jeremiah, Hananiah, of Ezra, Meshalem, of Amariah, Jehohanan, of Malachi, Jonathan, of Shebaniah, Joseph, of Harim, Adna, of Merioth, Helkai, of Edo, Zechariah, of Genethon, Meshalem, of Abijah, Zechariah, of Miniamin, of, Mo of Madoiah, Moida, Piltai, of Bilga, Shamua, of Shemaiah, Jehonathan, of Joyrib, Metani, of Jediah, Uzai, of Salai, Kalai, of Amak, Eber, of Hilkiah, Hashabiah, of Jediah, Nathanel. In the days of Elijah, Joida, jo Johanan, and Jadua, the Levites were recorded as heads of fathers' houses. So too were the priests in the reign of Darius the Persian. As for the sons of Levi, their heads of fathers' houses were written in the book of the Chronicles until the day of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. And the chiefs of the Levites, Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Cadmiel, with their brothers who stood opposite them to praise and to give thanks, according to the commandment of David, the man of God, watch by watch. Mataniah, Bakbakiah, Obadiah, Meshalem, Talmud, and Akub were gatekeepers standing guard at the storehouses of the gates. These were in the days of Joachim, the son of Jeshua, son of Josadak, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra, the priest and scribe. Amen. At this time, let us continue in worship as we hear the word of God delivered to us by Pastor Min. Good job. Uh, we're going through the book of Nehemiah and we're at that juncture the, after this week. I think uh, we have two more. Next two times I'll preach. We'll finish with uh, Nehemiah. Uh, here's an outline just to remind you where we are. First seven chapters about, of, are about rebuilding the wall. And then we, this semester, beginning of uh, this semester, three chapters, we went through the renewal of the uh, people, chapter 8 through 10. We uh, studied the revival through the word, revival through repentance, and revival through commitment. And now, with the rebuilding of the wall and revival of the people, renewal of the people, now chapter 11 through 13 is about restoration of the city. How uh, now these uh, Israelites are uh, reviving and renewing, rebuilding the city, restoration of the city for the glory of God. Uh, Chapter, this is list a bunch of names. There are few lists of names in the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 7 lists the names of the people who returned with Zerubbabel. Chapter 8 records the names of the leaders involved in the revival meeting at the Watergate. Chapter 10, uh, there were names, contain, uh, contained the names of 84 men who set their seals to the dedication of the covenant. They signed their names in their commitment as representative of the Israelites. And then this chapter, this, these two chapters, one and a half chapters, 11 through 12, the names of the people who repopulated Jerusalem and the surrounding cities. So when you look at these names, there's another one of those portions of the scripture. You look at, at thing and thinking, 
what is this? Why? Uh, I'll tell you my thinking process as soon as I looked at this list. My thinking process, my thinking process was, why did God put this in his inspired word? Should we read the whole text before I preach? These are the things I'm thinking about. What in the world should I preach from this? No one would like me after I spend the whole hour preaching from this. Newcomers will never come back. Find different church. Well, at least I don't need to read this chapter in public. Make some other guys do it. We call that ministry. <laughs> Whenever you don't want to do something, we create ministry. Uh, <laughs> then I come to senses as a pastor called by God. And think this, even this is part of God's word. Uh, they would never really read this on their own. Or well, sort of. They might skip it or read mindlessly or listen to the audio. I am called to teach the whole counsel of God. If we skip this part of the word of God, whether by not reading or not preaching from it, I am robbing from them the precious treasure of grace that is embedded in it that they could receive through this passage. A uh, few might leave. I we hope you don't. Some might not come back. We hope you come back. But those who remain will become kingdom workers. It's my thinking process. There are two kinds of listeners. One, in, first is that you listen to what does it say for me? Looking for that temporary. Is it interesting or relevant to me now? What does it say for me? But we need to become, what does it say? What does God say? First kind of listeners are temporary listeners. And rarely they would grow in their system. Rarely they would grow in the parts they need to know that's not interesting, but they need in their life. Second kind of listeners, what does he say? Just learning the word of God so that you grow in your foundation. You'll become, you, you become a foundational listener. You will grow in your system so that through the word of God, you can look at any topics, any uh, issues, able to make decisions, lead others to make decisions in your life. So always have them, this mentality, even though this seems like, list of the names seems like nothing to do with me. It still has much grace of God in it, so we will become foundational listeners of God's word. So this one and a half chapters, there's a lengthy register of names of the Jewish citizens. These almost two chapters include, we'll just list the names. We're going we're gonna to talk about lessons that we can get from it, but we need to categorize the names so that at least you know what's going on here. Verse, first two verses are the explanation about repopulation. Verse 1 and 2. And then uh, five kinds of names. First is families who repopulated Jerusalem. Chapter 11 through uh, 11, 3 to 9. And then secondly, the families who live in the cities of Judah and Benjamin. Chapter 11, 25 to 36. So these were the two tribes of southern kingdom that had composed the exiles in Babylon, now composed the community that has been restored. Third kind of name, priests and Levites of Zerubbabel's return, chapter 12, 1 through 9. And then chapter 12, 10 and 11, the high priest. And then lastly, the priests and Levites after Zerubbabel and Jeshua, verses 12 through 26 of chapter 12. And then uh, next week, the rest of the chapter 12 is basically about dedicating the wall now. Uh, just wonderful chat, a passion, a portion about dedicating the wall, finally finishing the wall and dedicating before the Lord. Though it seems like we're reading a phone book, <laughs> phone book might be easier, at least we can pronounce those names. There is, 
This is no rabble of refugees settling down anywhere. The names are the testimonies of God's faithfulness to his promises. Repopulation of Jerusalem. This was one of the major fulfillment. Just seeing this happen in this historical record, this was one of the major fulfillment of God's promises that he had given to Abraham, that God's going to give them land, God's going to give them children, and uh, Jerusalem will become center of, uh, you know, the test work of God. God had led them from slavery to the promised land, that, uh, which pictures what uh, he's doing for the people, God's people and the kingdom of God. So these people, as they are trying to live here, they're following their calling to be a kingdom of priests and holy nation. That's what they're doing. So these people had willing hearts to do whatever God wanted them to do. And each functioned in their own unique capacity. As we examine the section that lists the names of Jewish citizens and understand their situations from historical context in Israel's history, we can learn wonderful factors about how we can live for God's kingdom. We must understand, we too, as well as Israelites, here in this junction of their history, we are living in God's plan. We are in, we are in, each and every one of us, as we just live normal life, we are in the flow of God's redemptive history. All of God's people should be therefore kingdom-minded. All of God's people should be ministry-oriented in every facet, arena, of our lives. So what does it mean to have kingdom mindset or ministry mindset, living for God's kingdom? Four factors that we can learn from this passage and four ways to check. We'll, we'll do it through four questions. Here we go. First of all, are you willing to live where God wants you to live? That's the first question. And second question is, are you willing to serve in the arenas where God calls you to serve? Thirdly, are you willing to serve without credit? Fourthly, are you willing to love your community? So we can learn four factors how we can live for God's kingdom throughout your life. So this, these questions are not just, wow, I can do something today kind of thing. It's a, it's a lifetime thing. Framework and the perspective that we can learn from this chapter, wonderful chapter. So first of all, first question that we can ask ourselves and hope you remember these points throughout your life. First of all, are you willing to live where God wants you to live? Verse 1 and 2 talks about that they were repopulating the city and outside the city and they were, there was casting of lots and they actually moved intentionally, strategically, organizationally to different places to live. Nehemiah got the wall built, but there was not many people living in the city. At the time, you know, how many people, I was thinking, how many people uh, were living there? How many people are we really talking about when Israelites came back and all, those, all these things? And at the time of Jesus Christ, they say there were about 250 million people in the world at that time. At the time of Jesus Christ, that's like first century. So this was about four, five hundred years before this time of Christ. At the time, one scholar estimates conservatively total population of about 100,000 Jews in the land. About 100,000 Jews in the land. And they cast a lot and a tenth of them lived in, uh, were commanded to live in Jerusalem along with leaders. There, was, there were about 10,000 conservative estimates, about 10,000 were commanded to live in the city. So when people returned from the exile, the walls were torn down and there was a lot of rubble from the previous destruction. So it seems like, oh, living in a city now is still difficult. For some of you, maybe it's dangerous. I don't want to live in the city. Everybody wants to live in the suburb and things like that. But it was a lot more than that in those days. Uh, the city at that time had been without wall for hundred. Over, four, over 140 years, about 142 years. This meant the city had been defenseless for that time. And as a result, it was dangerous to live there. It would, have been, it would have required a lot of work to clear the rubble and restore the city. 
no apartments, no houses to go into. You actually had to do all these things to go into the city. So as a former capital, the restored city would have been a major target for enemies. During that time, enemies just attack. There's no uh, you know, defense, no laws about these things. As a former capital, enemies just could attack the city. They needed to run and lose their crops if enemies came back. No walls to protect them and all these things, right? So they just built a wall and they just are trying to go into the city. But it was a dangerous target for, uh, from other nations because they knew that they just built a wall and they were not a strong nation at this time. So at first, there wasn't much economic opportunities. It was far easier to settle out in the country and farm your own plot of ground. So most of the people had been content to live in the surrounding villages scattered across the land where their families used to live. But Nehemiah knew that if the city was to be strong and prosperous, if the worship in the temple was to thrive so that they could be the nation that proclaimed the name of God, the city had to be well populated and the citizens who could defend it in case of attack. So verse 11 says, The people cast lots to bring one of the ten to live in Jerusalem, 10%. And uh, that's what verse 1 says. So they cast a lot to pick one out of ten would move to Jerusalem. Uh, here the, I don't know, you can call it kingdom gentrification or something like that. Taking place, making God, so that God's name can be known. Of course, the intent is not racially motivated or economically motivated, but kingdom motivated. They were moving, scattering. And verse 2 said, and they were not, oh, man, I got selected. I have to go. I have to tell my wife. I have to tell them we're moving. Ah! You know, it wasn't like that. Verse 2 says, and the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. So we don't know if there were people selected and there were people who were actually willingly moved move, move together or the people who were selected were willingly moved together. But anyway, it seems like everybody, remember, this is after the revival. Everybody was so missions-minded. They were all willing to do whatever God wanted them to do. And it seems like verse 2 says they were all willing to do whatever God wanted them to do. The practice of redistributing population was also used to establish Greek and Hellenistic cities. It involved forcible transfer to, from rural settlement to urban centers. Although it was, but not these Jews. Although it was inconvenient and less desirable, even dangerous to move from the country to the city, the people willing to live where God wanted them to live in order to serve his purpose. One of the most... One of the first considerations that anyone who wants to serve God as you get older, as you graduate from uh, the college and university, and then as you're starting to work, you're becoming an adult. Right? One of the first considerations anyone who wants to serve God should think about is, where does God want me to live? Some people say, well, I want to go to this city. I want to get out of Champagne. I want to go south because it's cold. That is not a good reason for you to decide where you're going to live. Incredible system of transportation that we have. We can go anywhere in the world now. But you need to be intentional about praying through where you're going to live in your life. You know, CFC philosophy, we've been teaching this and it's, we're about 27 years old, I guess, as a church. And about 20 some years ago, it was like a revolution. It was given that anybody who graduated from college would get out of Champaign-Urbana or get out of the university setting and go to a major, major city to get a best possible job possible. And that is not a bad thing if you do it for the kingdom, if, you have, if you're intentional about that. But we started to teach us looking at Ephesians, and it seems like there's three kinds of callings that we have, daily calling, which is work. We, we teach this at CFC, right? Work family, and uh, church. So if you think about normal Christians in America now, as well as in those days, what, what they did was they decided to move because of a job. They choose a job, 
And then they look for a church. Where should I live? Uh, what church should I go to? Is there a church to go to? And then uh, they, you know, lived there and got married and raised a family. Nothing wrong with that. As long as you, again, you prayerfully, intentionally do it. Then I started to think about it and go, how about, why do we always choose job first, occupation first, and look for a church? How about some of us, if we can have a choice, choose the church first? Because as we look into the scripture, it seems like family, church, work, all important in the kingdom of God. Differently important, but all equally important for the kingdom of God. So how about choosing a, choosing a church first and try to get a job around there and then raise a family. And I started to propose that idea. It was revolutionary. I got a lot of bad whatever from parents and you know, <laughs> different kinds of people. But people started to do that. Now we have... That's why we have adult and young adult community that actually get, can get a job around here if they get a job around here and raise a family and build a kingdom got together doing all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, pray through. You must be intentional about where, you, where to live. If you get a legitimate job in different places and go and look for a church, that's a good thing. But sometimes if you can have options... Choose a church anywhere in the world. Choose the best church possible that you can agree with their vision and choose a church first. Then why don't you try to get a job anywhere in the world for the sake of the kingdom. Be intentional about how you can serve the Lord and then raise a family there and build, expand God's kingdom together in those places, which many of us are doing at our church. And that's why they're staying here intentionally for the kingdom of God. And that's a very biblical thing to do. Some of you do that in a minor scale where you uh, live in your dorms. You, where should I live? Oh, I want to live in my area. This is my mission field. Yeah, right. But we think like that. Hopefully you think like that and then you stay there. Some of you could live in different places, but I really want to reach out to my community and my uh, friends or in this younger people in our community. And I think that's a very biblical thing to do. It's a small practice you can do. Sometimes it may cause inconvenience for you, but some of you do that, and that's great. Some of you might, after you graduate and leave to cities and go, I really want to reach out to different ethnicities, different kinds of people uh, in different cities, and maybe you want to do that, but you want to be prayerfully, intentionally be like that. And we know that as we look into this passage, the rebuilding of the city center around building their religious base. Church is so important in the scripture, in the Bible. Try to always, if possible, go to a place there's a good church. If not, community going together to build a, plant a church or build a church. And that's such a biblical thing to do. Church is not just a place we go to. I'll, I'm going to go to church there. As far as church is not just a place that we go to. Just as family decision is oriented decision is important. Just as career decision is important. Okay? Church decision is important. Prayerfully think through all these things in balance and decide a place to live for his kingdom. So first question is, are you willing to live where God wants you to live? Second question is, that are you willing to serve in the arenas where God calls you to serve? Chapter 11 lists Bunch of names like this, just, just to give you an example. Heads of the families in Jerusalem. Verse 3, these are the chiefs of the province. Uh, names of the priests. Verse 10, it says, of priests. Uh, verse 15 talks about the Levites. Verse 19 talks about the gatekeepers. Verse 21 talks about the temple servants. Uh, verse 20 to 23 talks about the officials appointed by the king of Persia serving for the Jews. Verse 25 talks about the people who lived outside the city. We've been talking about mainly talking about the people who are inside the city, but they were actually in people who are living outside the city. So each of these uh, group of people, each served in his perspective arena for the for the effective operation of the city and the nation. Those who live outside of the city had to farm the land to provide food for those in the city as well. Each had different role, but each role was vital 
to the entire cause. In the body of Christ, God has gifted us in different ways, even the church, even in your small groups, even your area, small groups. Uh, in the church, we are gifted in different ways, but every part is vital for the overall function and the health of the body. Think about a part of your body shuts down. Think about one tooth hurting. It's painful. The whole body is painful. You jam your toe, one toe. You don't go, oh, my nine toes are fine. You don't do that. One toe hurts, everybody. The whole body hurts. You want to die. Jesus, come back right now. You jam your toes. You know, it's painful. We should learn to coordinate and complement each other without friction or rivalry. Are you willing to serve others? Are we willing to serve each other to strengthen one another? And that's what all the programs in the church are for. These long lists emphasize the importance of the people to God. Every one of these peculiar, difficult to pronounce names represents a person whom God knew and loved. The Christian faith is all about personal relationship, first to God, then with one another. Programs of the church should always be the means through which we minister to and train people through it. If a program is not doing that, we need to get rid of the program and replace it with something that contributes to, in our church, producing of the kingdom workers. Apart from programs, if you have a proper ministry mindset, you will seek to relate with people. We need to humbly serve each other, not be proud and not be critical. Often the problems often develop when we cannot get along with each other in the body of Christ. Because we just look at our own perspective and we don't understand other people. We need to understand other people. We we need to understand the situation from their perspective and try to minister to one another. It's like a mouth. If you are kind of body of Christ illustration, if you're like a mouth and somebody's like a hand, mouth looks everyone from the perspective uh, of the mouth only rather than the hand's view. Everything from the perspective of uh, not, you know, from the perspective of the hand. So mouth says to the hand, you just do things that is totally useless. It's talking, mouth is talking to the hand. You just do things totally useless and, and you don't contribute anything to the internal function of the body. You're just moving around and doing things and you don't, nothing goes inside of because of you. Uh, I, mouth is saying, I eat. It affects the whole body. Hand, you're so shallow. You just do any, everything outside. Hand can say to the mouth, You do nothing. You're just sitting there doing nothing. You just sit there and just eat. You don't work. Uh, You only get the pleasure of eating. But here's the thing. Reality is that if hand does not work, mouth will not be able to eat. Right? Oh, sorry about that. Oh, that hurts. (laughs) It's so shallow. If mouth does not eat... Think about it. If mouth does not eat, hand will not have strength to work. So mouth should value the the work of the hands, and the hand should value the work of the mouth. Uh, There are some people who are like this, who are so critical. Some people might say, wow, CFC, you know, you, you might not do that. I'm just illustrating. CFC, you know, don't care for people. We need, we need to care for people out there who are, you know, so weak, who are dying, who are poor. This isn't a caring church. Probably if you are critical like that, maybe God has given you to have mercy in your heart. So that maybe God, you are the answer to the weakness of this church. Maybe some of you say, wow, this church doesn't do outreach enough. Some people might say that. Maybe God has given you as part of the body so that you can develop that. You know, do it with others so that you can strengthen the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, Some of you might say, CFC is so disorganized. Rarely people will say that. CFC is organized. So when you go to other churches, you go, well, this church is so disorganized. You compare and all these things. But 
if you see this organization of the church, you, probably your gift is administration. So maybe you can volunteer and add to the weakness of the church. So, you know, whenever you see something wrong, that's probably your gift. So always redeem it and be part of the solution better than be part of the problems. So that's why uh, when people come, CFC, you know, CFC is not a program and all these things. We look at the people and we develop program through the people. Okay, who are gifted people, whose, whose heart that God has given to them in their heart to do something. Okay, if their burning desire is that, okay, we'll develop ministry to those things. So if you complain, we go, okay, you start that. You start that ministry. You start to do that. And that's what we will do. So whatever your gift is, utilize it and use it in the church and also use it in the workplaces, use it at home. Whatever you, that God has given you as your gift, use in all the spheres of your life to serve others. So are you willing to serve in the arenas where God calls you to serve? Uh, but also sometimes serve what is needed, urgently needed, rather than always looking for something that you're gifted in. Gift is not uh, only, uh, the only things that you are good at, right? No, gift, gift is not only the things that you are good at, but that you can do it now. Some people think gift is, oh, something you're good at. But sometimes it's something you're good at. Something you can do right now, okay, that, you know, maybe God is calling you to do that, although you might not be good at it at times. Gift is not only your ability, but also your availability. Time and hard to serve. You might not be good at it. Maybe you will become good at it, but sometimes it's needed because no one else will do it. And that's all needed in the kingdom of God. So, question is, are you willing to serve in the arenas where God calls you to serve? Second question. Third question is, are you willing to serve God without credit? Most of these names mean nothing to us, right? Unless maybe one of your names is exactly the same as the list. Some aren't even listed by name, but are lumped together with all of their, like, family uh, names, kinsmen, friends as a group. For example, like Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 14, it says, Their brothers, mighty men of valor, 128. So overseer's name is listed here, but it says, Their brothers, mighty men of valor, 128, unnamed, except to say they were valiant warriors. But the 128 valiant warriors were no small part of a secure, safe city. Possibly sometime in their history, they risked their lives. Some of them might have even died protecting their city, just like so many soldiers uh, do for, uh, of course, our country as well as uh, many other countries. The churches, church needs many people like that in order to function well. CFC will shut down, <laughs> like our government, if we don't have many who labor faithfully Behind the scenes. Uh, if you, don't, you, you just don't understand, and sometimes I don't understand, hundreds of things that went on so that you can sit here, so I can come here, we can have worship together like this. Hundreds of things that went on. I wish somebody can just record everything that happens so that this can happen at our church. Hundreds, probably hundreds of factors and all kinds of people being involved so that this can happen. So that we can worship God, we can grow, uh, uh, have burning heart for the Lord so we can expand God's kingdom in this community. These unseen servants, they are like your vital organs. Right? Uh, and you never see them. But when, but when one of them shut down, we're in big trouble. Uh, look at verse, 11, uh, verse 16. It's the chief of the Levites who were over the outside work of the house of God. So Levites were like assistants to the priests. Priests were the kind of main people. Levites had the lesser roles. And then 
priest worked inside the house of God, and people can kind of see that, and Levites had to work outside the temple of God. They don't really get much credit. They're like assistant to the priest. They don't really get credit. Lesser role than the priest, but if they didn't do the work outside the house of God, priests could not do the work inside the house of God. Same thing with temple servants uh, in Nehemiah 11 verse 21. There were temple servants who were kind of assistant even to the Levites. And these people didn't get much credit, but they were faithful. Just like 100, again, 100 things go on at CFC. We know that all these people, the names that are mentioned and doing different kinds of things, they were faithful. They were not famous. They were not fancy, but they were faithful. You don't need to be famous. You don't need to be fancy, but we need to be faithful. It's the motivation that counts. If we serve and try to gain esteem and recognition, we are going to, we are doing it for wrong reason. We'll get angry when others do not give us acclamation that we're seeking. We are serving to get something. We'll cause problems. And remember that when you are faithful, even if no one recognizes you, God notices. Even no one else notices you. God saw fit to record these names that mean absolutely nothing to us. But they meant something to God. Each and every one of these names meant something to God. And that's what ultimately matters. If you are getting upset because no one in the church notices all that you do, your focus is in the wrong place. I remember 20-some years ago, there was a, a person who served a lot. But every time she meets me, she complains. <laughs> She served a lot, but every time she meets me, she complains. Not the fact that she, there are different people that complain about different kind of things, but she complained about not for the amount of work, but amount of work she has, but no one else is helping her. I'm like, I just wanted to say up to here, don't, don't do it anymore. <laughs> Stop doing it. You're part of the problem, even though you're doing things. I didn't say that. I wish I said that. Uh, if you're going to complain, stop doing it. Okay. There's someone else that can do it for the kingdom. And if you do it like that, it's not good for your heart, even if you do things. Again, my suggestion is don't stop doing it. Redeem your heart. Fight your heart and keep serving. That's my first suggestion. But God records all of their names. And we know we have the uh, book in eternity that records all of our deeds. If you're seeking for the praise of other people, you're, you want to be written in a wrong book. You're seeking for wrong praise, appro approval of wrong people. You only need approval of one person. You only need the approval of God. Look to the Lord whom you are serving. A couple verses, no and yes verse, no verse. Matthew 6 verse 1, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And you will have no reward. Very simple. It's not even warning. It's a promise. You will have no reward. No verse, but there's yes verse. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. As you still do, he's going to remember. Headlines of the earth has Trump, Olympic in it. Headlines of heaven, servants of God, finishers of the kingdom race. That's in the headlines of heaven. Don't try to be famous in this world. Be famous in the kingdom of God. Be famous at home. Be famous in the kingdom of God. Uh, even though those people whom, I, I believe there will be many famous people in, in heaven whose names that not many people know in this world. Three questions we asked so far. Are you willing to live where God wants you to live? Secondly, are you willing to serve in the arenas where God calls you to serve? Thirdly, are you willing to serve God without credit? Fourthly, 
Are you willing to love your community? And we do this together. Each person, each family, uh, each, you know, church, right? Kingdom of God, together. So when we think about community, reaching out to community, we're so geared towards just thinking about justice work, social justice work, uh, which is good emphasis these days, justice work. You know, work work through racism, poverty, reach out. Uh, So these are all good. Social justice work is good, but I believe, biblically speaking, it's just too narrow if you just think about that. It's good to think about those things, but there's work, biblical work is a lot wider than just some of the emphasis that we have in social justice work. Don't just limit that, limit of serving God in the community as just popular uh, topics and popular social justice work. We need all that, but we need uh, biblical justice work, and mercy work is a lot wider than that. Uh, it, we can learn three things from the whole, in fact, whole, this chapter as well as whole book of Nehemiah. Three things how we can help impact the community okay, through the outline of the whole book. Three things. First of all, responding to the need we see in Nehemiah chapter 1 through 7. Basically, they're building a wall in a city, responding to the need of the people. Building the city, visible, tangible help in the community. They were doing that. Uh, when CFC started, 197, not, what is, if my mind is blank. Huh? 1999? 1990! That's right. It's been 27 years, so I forgot. 1990, when CFC started, started there was nothing here. No CFC. So when we came, we go, what is the biggest need of this community? Well, 40,000 students. So we started to reach out to the community. Started with students. Of course, we grew. We're not just student church. We have young adults. We have adults and family members and their kids, youth group and all these things. So we st- still have a, you know, college ministry, campus ministry that is strong and known, but our our. Reaching out to the community is growing more and more to post-college and community and youth and children and on. So first principle is responding to the need. That's what the Israelites did. And second thing is equipping the church. If we're equipping the people of God, Nehemiah chapter 8 through 10, basically reviving, gathering together, worshiping, spiritually growing together. Community of God's people growing together, spiritually revived through these three chapters that we have seen. Nehemiah chapter 8 through 10, that's what they're doing. And then Nehemiah 11 through 13, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the name of God through kingdom gentrification. Uh, we, same thing, uh, the, you know, the Israelites are going to now uh, propagate, go to different parts of the city and around the villages around them and really impact the community, spreading the name of God. And that's what we're doing. We try to spread different places in Champaign-Urbana, in surrounding towns, dorms. And, you know, we have about 30% of uh, unbelievers coming to our church, being part of our church. We try to reach out as much as we can. We're not the only church in this campus, but we're doing what we can, uh, what the community that we can reach out to. And we see, and as we look into this passage, there, they are going to spread the joy of God. To their community, as we see in these Israelites, that's what Nehemiah chapter 11 through 13 is doing. These are the three things, three, uh, you know, three things, responding to the need, equipping the church, proclaiming the gospel. I'm, I'm actually in a, a missions organization, part of a mission organization called SIM, Serving in Mission, and that's over 100 years old. And it's their really mission statement and their logo, responding to the need, proclaiming the gospel, and equipping the church. They meet the need in, in the mission field. In their mission is all over the world. Uh, and then they proclaim the gospel. And, and, and then they also equip the church so the church can, by meeting their need of the people, proclaim the gospel. And when I saw these three things, wow, that principle can apply anywhere in the world in the mission field as well as reaching out to different cities. And, and that's what we see in the book of Nehemiah, borrowing their uh, mission statement to our outline in reaching the city. 
Tony Evans agrees. Tony Evans uh, uh, is an excellent Bible teacher and his wonderful ministry in, I believe, in Texas, Dallas area, an African-American preacher. And he talks about 10 steps to urban renewal. In this article, he mentions like Zion Bible teaching, rejection of government dependence, use of spiritual gifts, and discipling converts, and all these things. But one of the main things he says, one of the main things you need to reach out to community is that no, reach out to the world and the communities is the church becoming a community. Church becoming a community. This is what he wrote. The church is first and foremost a spiritual family, a community. That's why the Bible refers to the church as a house of faith, family of God, brothers and sisters. It's meant to function as a family, model family life, and care for the families it encompasses. And then the community and the world will see them and be attracted by them in their relationship and come to know the Lord. Well, this verse is used a lot for social justice ministry. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. It's a wonderful verse on how to reach out to community. These three things. Justice. To do justice. To love kindness and walk humbly with our God. What does it mean by do, to do justice? Most people interpret it, I believe, uh, in a narrow way. Oh, you do justice work. You know, em emphasize social justice. Emphasize justice work in the community. But mainly when it says to do justice, means it's for us, for believers, that we become uh, people of justice. We act justly in our normal daily life. We act with integrity. We act by doing the correct things, doing the right things for the kingdom of God. Uh, we become good people. We become people of character, people of integrity. That you don't, you don't commit injustice, hurt other people in community and to other people. You become the people of God that are doing the right thing so that we can earn credibility from people in the world. That's what to do justice there means. And to love kindness. You, are, you become merciful people, generous people, helping others. Okay? With integrity and character, you become loving, uh, become generous people. And then it says to walk humbly with your God. Humble people. That comes from our relationship with God. And that's, if we live like that, we can be the people that will reach out to this community. Ray Baki, he was one of the oil speakers. He's, he's one of the representatives in our generation about how to reach the city. Uh, in, in our generation. This is what he said. I think God wants to bless the cities and he waits for a renewed church, church of Jesus Christ in different places, acting like uh, the church of Jesus Christ in their community will impact and influence the community. I'm just thinking, if CFC does not exist in this campus and in our community, my question to you is how many people would know if CFC doesn't exist in our church, or in our community, in this campus, will people know? Whoop, we're gone. Where, where's CFC? Will people know? I'm not going to answer the question. I think so many people should know. That's what I'm saying. Okay? Because we are so entangled in holy entanglement with the community and the people who are who do not know Christ in all kinds of walks of life, that if God pulls us out to somewhere else, you know, it should really be noticed in the world because we are, there are so many holy entanglements we have in this community. My God, they're everywhere. <laughs> Talking about CFC people. Not causing problems in a restaurant kind of way. They're everywhere. They're they have people of character, people of integrity. They're so generous. They're so nice. And they're so humble. We can impact the community. I love this verse. We're going to talk about this verse next week too, but I had to bring it out. <laughs> I had to bring it. I love this verse. I'm just thinking about this verse and just at uh, parts at the end just, you know, just so blesses me. Uh, chapter 12, verse 40 through 3. This is after the dedication of the place. And, they, and people worship God. 
And this is what is written in verse 43. They offer great sacrifices that day and rejoice. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. And the women and children also rejoiced. And then it says, and the, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. I pray that this will be the reputation of our church. The joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. We're going to show this video clip, a little three minutes and 40 seconds. At the risk of mood, people's mood being sad, we already read this chapter too, so you might dislike me more. But at the risk of getting people's mood sad, at the risk of bringing out more questions and answers politically and theologically about gun control and you know, theologically, why does bad things happen to these people? I still would like to show this video, remembering these 17 people, 17 uh, mostly teenagers and some teachers that lost their lives in the Parkland, Florida shooting. Um, I want to show this video clip uh, so that we can remember them.
My feeling after seeing this video was that I was motivated. It motivated me to just love the people where I am individually. Like this chapter that we read, like this chapter, God knew these teens and teachers individually. So we remember their names. Death is ordained to everyone. Some comes to some comes quicker than others. But so is life. Life is ordained to everyone. Some is shorter than others. Some longer than others. But while we are alive, we are all called to love and care for those around us as long as we are breathing. Each person around us matters to God. So where we live is important. What we do with them is important and why we do it is very important because he knows everyone around us. He knows their name and he loves them. So may we show his love uh, to them through us. Let's pray. Pray to the Lord for a few minutes and just pray that we will live for God's kingdom. We'll have a kingdom mindset. We'll be prayerful in the future about where we live, what spheres we serve. That we'll do our best to do it for him. And then just, uh, you know, continually impact that community with group of people, group of friends in the body of Christ. Let's pray to the Lord for a few minutes that we'll have kingdom mindset, prayerfully living for him, for his glory. Let's pray.